Welcome to Prosecco and Pros episode one. I know, right? This week's Prosecco is Nicolio. And this week's Pros is The Bog Girl by Karen Russell. Thank you for joining us for an episode of Prosecco and Pros. I'm Wendy. And I'm Amy. This is a deep dive virtual book club hosted by two English teachers and army wives who love to read and love the bubbly. In each episode, we will feature a discussion on a novel from our local DC Metro book club. Or we will chat about some of the latest and greatest pieces of prose. We will also answer questions our listeners send us in our sparkling wine box. (laughs) She said sparkling wine box. What an oxymoron. So sit back and pop a cork for this week's episode of Prosecco and Prose. For those of you who are listening in the car, please don't drink and drive. Save the bubbly for later. In this episode, we will discuss Karen Russell's short story, The Bog Girl. It was published in The New Yorker on June 13, 2016. It's also included in her book Orange World and Other Stories, which was released in May of 2019. Miss Russell is from Miami, Florida, though now resides in Portland, Oregon. She has won several awards and accolades to include the 2012 and 2018 National Magazine Award for Fiction, as well as being a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize for her first novel, Swamplandia. Kind of a big deal. So cool. If you have not read this story yet and do not want spoilers, there's going to be spoilers, guys. You can find the free readable and audio version at www.thenewyorker.com. In the search engine, type The Bog Girl. Take a listen, or take a read, and then come back. So, Amy, um, you found this story, and it's great how you found it. Can you tell us? So, you know, I was recently talking to my folks. You know, they're from Montana. Um, I was talking to them on the phone after you and I had been carousing around D.C. We do that sometimes. We do. So I mentioned that spring is sprung. I was trying to make them a little jealous, you know, because it's still cold up there. Yeah, I know. I'm from North Dakota. (laughs) I was telling them how we were bombarded with the smells of all the mulch and the peat that was being dressed around the D.C. shrubbery. (sighs) Now, mind you, while talking to them, every app on my phone and computer, to include my Google Whips, was open. I never closed down anything on my phone or computer, and it drives my hubs crazy. I I don't close down anything either. Well, fast forward. I was searching for short stories for this virtual book club, and guess what story showed up at the top of my search after talking about all this mulch and peat? Uh, yeah. Uh, a little something about some boggy stuff? Oh, yeah. You guessed it. It was it, right at the top. It said, The Bog Girl, A Romance by Karen Russell. It that's scary. That's weird. You know, I can be extremely erratic in my story selection, so out of respect of your time. Thank you. Um, I read it a couple times before I laid it on you. I'm really glad I did. This story was amazing. But the moral of the story is just really be careful what you say and do, especially when your web browser uh, is open. You know, Big Brother is always listening. Apparently so. So, well, maybe we'll cover that moral in a future uh, story we're going to cover in another episode. But, you know, I was thankful that Mr. Google recommended Russell's story as it was just kind of the absurdity we needed to press forward with our virtual book club. I have to say, I agree. It was a great suggestion by oh, yeah, it's been a fun nosy, story. nosy Google, and I'm really glad you shared. So I think it might be good to start with introducing our characters to the bog girl. I agree. Okay. I'm going to start with our protagonist, Killian. He is a kind, intelligent, and unusual 15-year-old boy with an on-again, off-again speech impediment. I mean... He, he's an outcast, really. Um, his uh, judgmental aunts, though, have paid him the modern compliment of assuming he is gay. Yeah, I read that. You know, and I'm going to negate that. Um, as I think Killian experiences kind of the trials and tribulations of having a first girlfriend, you know, Russell shows that he's weak and he's small, which doesn't necessarily translate to being gay. True. But I'm gonna. I'm curious to hear what our listeners' thoughts are on that. Oh yeah, I would like to hear that too. Um, let's move on to the 2,000 year old, presumably murdered Bog Girl. She is Killian's very first girlfriend, who was found on the western edge of the peat bogs. 
She has a noose wrapped around her neck. I mean, that's probably a murder. murder. Yeah. Um, that's what the story is never removed. And she always seems to have a smile on her face. And, uh, you know, it kind of reminded me of the Mona Lisa smile. Oh, yeah. But what kind of freaks me out is that noose, you know? Ugh. I just wanted to remove it. The entire story, remove the noose. Look at the noose. Remove it around, you know, from her neck. It's just crazy. Um, next, we have Jillian, the single mother to Killian. Uh, she ran away with Killian's father when she became pregnant as a teen. But she does come back to the island alone with Killian when he was a toddler. She appears to be really overprotective. She truly seems to want the best for her son. She does, I think. Now, I'm going to go ahead and take Uncle Sean. I would just be remiss not to mention him. Listeners, envision the character of Fat Bastard from the movie Austin Powers. Ugh. Ugh. He's the only male model Killian appears to have in the story. You're right. Great visual of Uncle Sean, because <laughs> that's what I see now, Bart right? Bastard. But Bastard. <laughs> I mean, and as a male role model, wow, he's fantastic. I mean, he's <laughs> not. <laughs> he's unemployed. <laughs> he's a freeloader. And he's always at the Edoas' cottage just drinking beer and playing video games. He's my favorite character, though. You know, even though he makes me cringe. Why don't you go ahead and give us a very brief summary of the plot to refresh our listeners' minds? I'll pipe in here and there, but just go ahead. Okay, sure thing, Amy. So, again, for those of you that haven't read the story and would like to read it first, I suggest you pop over to thenewyorker.com because um, there will be some spoilers here. So, The Bog Girl is the story of 15-year-old Killian Edwis. He happens upon the body of a young girl buried in the bog, and her hand, ironically, flagging him look down. Look at me! Look at me! <laughs> right. Um, she has been wholly preserved for thousands of years. But Killian, he just immediately falls in love with his bog girl and brings her home to live with him and Jillian. This bog girl quickly becomes the center of Killian's world. She appears to replace Killian's mother. I mean, it's so new, you know. Gillian, she's trying. She outwardly appears to support Killian's budding relationship, but her inner thoughts show us she is not happy with this romance. No, she's not she's liking not. it. The bog girl and Killian spend the summer together, and when school starts, he brings her to school with him, normal, where she quickly becomes <laughs> one of the most popular girls in school. And Killian, he is definitely not part of the in crowd. Um, he never has been. And even now, with this hugely popular girlfriend of his, he just, like, still remains on the fringes of the in-crowd. Yes, definitely. He kind of takes his bog girl to the annual school dance and then off to the after party. And then when he looks over the crowd, he feels certain he is the only one of these kids who just truly knows about love. Right. He's, he's so certain <laughs> that he's the only one that has any inkling what love is. So, dreams middle school. Um, so, you know, he's completely infatuated with this bog girl. He starts to do poorly in school. Yep. He dreams of running away with the bog girl. But then, one night, the bog girl wakes up and his fantasies, I mean, this world he's created, just comes crashing down around him. There's definitely a lot packed into the short story. I mean, I know I've spent a lot of nights mulling over the complexity of this text. And just kind of contemplating how we want to share its contents with our listeners. But let's first take a break and refill our Prosecco glasses before we deep dive into the story. Okay, Amy. Themes or symbols? Go. Symbols. Yeah, so <laughs> what about symbols? This is your wheelhouse, not oh, mine. Okay, okay then. Um, I'm just kind of feeling a little bogged down here um, with the bubbly. So let's just start off with the symbol of the bog. You know, pun intended, it's just a little English teacher humor. I, I got it. All right, this bog. I mean, didn't you say it occurs over 100 times in this 7,000 plus word story? Yep, I'm a word nerd. Yes. So, obviously, it's important. But exactly what is the importance of this bog? Well, you know, Miss Russell beautifully personifies the setting of the story, which is 
what I kind of assumed is the bog in Northern Ireland. She doesn't come right out and say it, but I mean, one can truly with all the colors and everything in it, we assume that it's Northern Ireland. I agree. She kind of refers to the bog. You know, I'm just thinking back to my studies, you know, kind of a deconstructionist manner uh, where it shows a lot of uh, different binary oppositions. Mm. Uh, Russell writes that the bog is a dead place. You know, it's cold, it's acidic, it's anaerobic, but its substance is used as an energy source, you know, kind of heat and light. It helps people on the island live. Right. I mean, and I loved the quote. Let me find my notes here. Uh, let's see. Okay. Sphagnum mosses wrap around the fur, wood, skin, casting their spell of chemical protection, preserving them whole. Growth is impossible and death cannot complete her lean work. Isn't that amazing? Yes. The pen language of Karen Russell. It's really rich. It just really draws you in. She's incredible. In the bog, you know, really nothing can live, nothing can die. It's a neutral place of wholeness. Russell gives the bog a feminine distinction throughout the course of the reading. I caught it several times. Hmm. Uh, you know, it kind of is what nurtures, like a mother would, um, nurtures and fuels Killian's first love. So do you have anything else that you might want to share about the bog? With us? Uh, I do, actually, because I was looking at the bog as it could also be looked at as the alpha and the omega, you know, the beginning and the end, because it is the beginning and the ending of Killian and the bog girl's relationship. I mean, it was in the bog where Killian first loved the bog girl, but it's where he eventually returns to bury her. Oh, you know, and let me add this. Okay, it was... um. The bog where Killian made maddening love with a live corpse. Well, I mean... Don't give me that look. For me, that's still for debate. I'm not going to get down and dirty. I'm just still not convinced that they made love. But maybe our listeners have an opinion on this. So, listeners, if you do, please share your thoughts with us on our Twitter feed at PNPros. No, really. I mean, I'm truly, I'm looking at, I'm looking at the story. It's the fourth paragraph from the end. Get your papers out. Okay. Fourth paragraph from the end. Yep. It starts with, this was a bad breakup. Oh, okay. I got it. Okay. Let me read this to you with my little twist. A quarter of a mile from the cottage under a bright moon, Killian and the bog girl were rolling in the mud each screaming in a different language. Their screams twined together, their hands reaching for each other. It was during this undoing that they were at last truly united as a couple. His flashlight rolled with them, plucking amphibious red and yellow eyes out of the reeds. It's over. It's over. It's over. He kept babbling optimistically. Out of his mind with fear, she clutched at the collar of his t-shirt, her body covered in dark mud and cracked stem of bug cotton. Last, he felt her grip on him, loosen, her eyes opaquely glinting in the moonlight liquid and enormous, far larger than anyone could have guessed before their unliving, regarded him with what he imagined was a soft surprise and disappointment. If that doesn't scream sex, I don't know what does. God, I almost need a cigarette. Someone turn the air down. Uh, okay. <laughs> Notice I'm a little Come speechless. On. Wow, that was Why an are you sweating? That was an excellent reading of that passage. I hope your parents and my aunt Dot aren't listening. <laughs> I'm gonna oh, have no. to say though, right? <laughs> you do make a compelling argument. But I'm gonna go back to the clean version of the bog now and let's tie up this loaded and complex symbol. Okay, go ahead. I'm, I've started to cool down a little okay, bit. Okay, go ahead. 
I feel like we could take it one step farther and look at the bog as old and new. Okay. I mean, initially it was traveled by the gods, and then in opposition, it is now traveled by the industrial harvesters. And Russell does such a wonderful job painting her binary pictures of how the setting has changed. Right? Okay. So, another symbol. Let's move on to the noose. Please keep it clean. I'm almost afraid to go there. (laughs) (laughs) No worries, Wendy. I've cooled off a little bit. So, obviously, the noose is going to be a symbol of violence and death. Uh, I mean, here we have another example of binary opposition, too. So when Killian discovers the bog girl at the beginning of the story, he sees a perfectly serene face and views her as a person, cradling her face in his lap. Yes, but it's contradicted when one of um, Killian's co-workers sees the noose wrapped around the girl's neck, and then this co-worker signifies the girl as the body. But... In the end, he fantasizes about running away with her. The reader is like truly drawn into somewhat of, let me say, like a metaphorical suffocation where uh, Russell writes about Killian's noose getting tighter and tighter and tighter. True. Uh, And you... Also, you just mentioned the word contradiction. I mean, this story has so many oppositions and contradictions. Would you agree with me that it reads almost like absurd fiction? Yeah, absolutely. I'd agree with that. Now, I I don't want to walk away from the symbolism, but this would explain why we struggled so much with which symbols to talk about, as there were so many that we were worthy of discussion. And they seem... You're right. I mean, to me, they seem more important to cover in depth than even the underlying um, themes and character sketches. I think you definitely are on to something, Wendy, because um, in absurd fiction, I mean, I studied in college Camus a lot. Right. You know, his humor is dark. And this piece was dark. It did have kind of a fun satirical read. Definitely. You know, it was irrational. Um, It's ironically humorous. You know, Killian is conflicted. And trying to find the answers to his life through this bog girl. But she the one thing is, is she's safe. But of course she's dead. Right. I mean, there's, there's definitely many instances in here of dark humor and absurdity. And one of my favorite ones is the dinner table. Oh, yeah. That right? was delicious. I mean, the no fa- pun intended. <laughs> Good one, though. Mm-hmm. The family dog barrels into the dining room, and, you know, he's just a dog. He wants to play tug-of-war with the bog girl's noose. Of course he would. Killian. I mean, he is shamed and embarrassed, but, you know, he calms when his eyes lower from her smile to the noose, knowing the bog girl's seen worse. Of course she has. What about that school dance? Mm. Let's mention the school dance. Wait, we can't not. When the ever-romantic Killian swoops up this bog girl, throws the noose over his shoulder, it's like it's Killian to the rescue as he takes her to the dance floor. Can you just picture this? I can. I can. And I just want him to remove the noose. Me too. I mean, it's not every day that a socially awkward teenage boy takes a dead girl to a dance, or, I mean, even a non-socially awkward boy. And this would explain why he's now (laughs) failing school and every molecule of his focus is tied up with the bog girl. Nice play on words. Hey, let's talk about two more contrasting symbols before we turn it over to our listeners to find, you know, kind of what symbols stood out to them. Just two? Yeah, we really, we, we can't go all day. I know. Let's look at the eyes and the encompassing, you're gonna like this, Motif. Oh, I do. Of absence of vision. And then what about the unstoppable smile that conceals the motif of death? Amy, you and these binary oppositions, where did you go to school? Wendy, Austin P., the same as you. Remember, I was the girl with the 800 pound backpack of pencils, pens, highlighters hand gel, encyclopedias. Oh yeah, that that, that sounds about right. Um, <laughs> we just graduated in different New Year's. Hey, hey let's, let's go, go pee. pee. Eyes are the windows into the soul, and Killian's celery greens caught my baby blues in the first paragraph. You know, Killian has vision, but 
It's truly like a blind vision. Throughout the story, the bog girl's eyes are shut. So we're forced away from her eyes, which makes us focus on her smile. Exactly. I mean, we can't see her, really. I want to go back to when Killian initially finds the bog girl because he is so baffled and confused that the men keep calling her the body. Oh, yeah. I mean, Killian feels that they're blind. He feels they are blind to the deep and flowing life behind her smile. You know, the smile, the Mona Lisa smile I mentioned. Mm -hmm. It's his sole means of communication with the bog girl. Hey, wait a minute. Hold up. So I'm envisioning this smile as an art. Ooh. Very symbolic. The Bog Girl's smile has its own symbolic arc throughout the entire story. Oh, you are on to something. So first, when Killian finds her, she has, let me find my notes here, an impressive smile. What do you think that she was impressed by? What do you suppose? Well, I mean, this is at the beginning, right? When mm -hmm. he finds her? Mm-hmm. She's probably impressed that he found her after a thousand years, someone finally found her, you know? Okay, I agree with that. But then in that same paragraph, her smile has a dream life flow to it. Killian whispers to the bog girl, and I quote, There is so much more to you than what they see, unquote. They being his co-workers who see her as only a body. Then he goes on and apologizes to her uh, for what's happened. And he whispers, uh, he's going to keep her safe now. I just got this vision. He was like petting her, petting her like a cat. Uh, yeah, if you guys could see this, that's exactly what Amy is doing. I'm not a cat person, sorry. <sighs> maybe it's a dog. But yeah, maybe. I mean, you know, it does remind me why close reading and literary analysis is so important because to be honest, I missed that quote. So it does give blind vision a new perspective for me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's move forward um, to the next smile in the story. Let's see here. Where the university man tries to take the bog girl away. Let's see. Um, oh, right, right. Um, she's ahead. propped against that ironing board. Like, <laughs> it's so funny. <laughs> it's hilarious. And she's just watching, which her eyes are shut, so... But Russell says she's watching all those around with a condescending smile, like, she knows, you will not be removing me from this family. I like that biscuit smile. When Jillian asks Killian, does she like biscuits, Kale? But this smile, you know, it's now it's a gentle smile, as if to reassure Mom that she's not the interloper into her son's life that Jillian fears. Or maybe she's just hungry. You know, it's been like 2,000 years. Biscuits? I want a biscuit. Corpse got to eat. This is going so fast. <laughs> I mean, um, I know. I know now why you like this story. You so thrive yes. on the absurd. I do. I do. And speaking of the absurd, you know, just to keep you interested, Amy, let's look back at the tug of war dog experience, right? Did you know the smile Miss Russell uses there? Do you have it? Yeah. So the bog girl uh, during the tug of war experience kind of has a mysterious smile. More specifically, a mysterious kindness type of smile, like the maybe the Mona Lisa smile you mentioned earlier. Yeah. You know, she reveals to Killian that this pooch tugging on my chain isn't so bad. Obviously. Obviously. I have secrets that are much worse. Yeah. That's, that's. <laughs> so, dinner. I wish you could see Wendy's face right now. <laughs> I'm sort of at a loss. Can you tell, guys? But uh, the next smile is still, we're still at dinner. But dinner is finishing and she's just smiling blindly to the ridiculous of Amy's favorite character, Uncle Sean. Because... He's passed out in a pool of gravy after what? A thousand is, beers. A thousand beers. <laughs> Yuck. Can't you just smell them? Uh, no, I can't, and I'm very thankful for that. <laughs> well, now the bog girl is sitting with Killian in class. They're Now they're at school. Um, as teachers, we know that students have been known to drift off into dreamland. Yours? No, I mean... Well, mine did all the time when I was teaching. I think some of them just outrightly went to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> I 
I mean, even I've done it myself often. I think I'm going there now. Uh, I daydream all the time. So here we have the bot girl in class, dreamlessly smiling, completely untroubled by the fact that her presence is frightening and flustering the teachers. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's kind of an everyday experience of dreamlessly smiling teenagers. You know, they definitely don't have literature on their minds. Not usually. They don't. <laughs> but I'm going to hope that some of them do. How okay. about that? I'm going to take the next smile. So maybe you don't ruin it for me. Um, we now have the bog girl. I know you're going to love this one. She's lying next to Killian in the bed, thin as a dress, with a smile that is described as desiccatedly calm. What a great description. Emotionless. Completely. But it appears Killian is back at the moment when they first met and he fell in love. You remember that euphoria of first being in love? Oh, yeah, I do. I remember my first love. <laughs> Killian is trying to recapture... You were back the in euphoria, weren't you? I was. So Killian, you know, uh, he's trying to recapture the intensity of initial love. But like in contrast, Bob Girl just said, you know, he's a mo she was emotionless. She was distant. You know, she wasn't engaged. Yeah, she definitely has no intensity um, in the situation. But... We go to our next smile, and this is when Killian is telling the bog girl his fantasy of running away together, and her smile during this, you know, this time is just constant. It's not changing. It's not doing anything. He's almost not getting any emotion from it. And so he starts to question if she's really as invested in his fantasy as he is. I mean, the adults around him are definitely not supportive. I agree. I agree. This kind of leads me to change of smile. Ooh. This is getting exciting. The bog girl wakes up and she looks at Killian with a smile that is frozen. Guess whose smile is gone? Killian. Yep. I mean, I wish I could have been a fly on that wall. All right, Venus. All right. Back into your fly trap. Because this arc of a smile that we've been talking about has made us blind to the eyes, which are really an important symbol, too. We did get a little intense with a smile, so let's backtrack. I want to backtrack to sleeping arrangements. Mm. Back to the beginning, yeah. The bog girl spends the first two weeks sleeping on the Edoess's couch. That's good. And then one night, without permission, Killian moves her into his love shack of a bedroom, closes the door, and locks it. Mom wasn't ready for that. Love shack, Amy. I mean, really love hold on, shack. Hold on, hear me out. So, Corpse, love shack. Jillian's panicked, and she sees that she is losing control of the situation. The next morning, Killian enters the kitchen, kind of awkwardly making himself a cup of joe. He's a big boy now. Kisses his mom, leaves for work, and whistles something like, boom, boom. Bow, bow. Let's get it you on. Got it. I really got that. Wait. <laughs> okay. That was a little intense. Yeah. What does that have to do, guys? Okay, interloper. Um, I love that word. I just, <laughs> it is a good word. But let me get to it. So, mom is watching. I'm, I'm on track here. Mom's watching this change. Moms do this watch everything. Coming of age in her only child, her son. And she doesn't like it. But she's afraid to go there. Well, she should have put her foot down uh, that very night. She sees that she has to do something. Uh, Russell portrays her as being paralyzed. Her only recourse is to establish a new rule after this fact. The rule being that everyone has to wear clothes and no more locked doors. Are you picturing the ball girl right now? Because... Mm. Before, I had not really pictured, but now I'm like, wait a minute. Now we have a 2,000-year-old naked bug girl. Mm, I can attest to this. Maybe I can't, but... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe know, not to the bog girl, no, but to the situation, situation. with mom. Yeah. You know, um, I have an only son who was once a teenager. I, the kid's almost 30 now. But uh, you do have to pick and choose your battles. So, you know, the teens don't shut down on you. Right. Sometimes you don't see what's going on and you just have to make those quick decisions in attempts to prevent what we call in our house Armageddon. 
But let me make this clear. I would have never allowed a dead corpse or a living young lady into his bedroom. Especially one without clothes, right? Right. <laughs> well, <laughs> there are definitely many more instances of vision, sight, and, you know, symbolism dealing with the eyes and all that. I do love how it comes out in the climax of the story because as the bog girl starts to wake up, oh, yeah. Killian, he's resisting opening his eyes. But when he does, and he subsequently looks into the bog girl's eyes, he's really terrified at the reflection. Well, I mean, he's seeing what he has put into her and their relationship over these past months. Ms. Russell writes, he is now its object. Oh, yeah. It's the perfect reversal. She is woke, and she sees Killian, her knight in shining armor. Yeah, she's woke, all right, and he cannot handle it. All right, love to stay on the symbols, but we just don't have the time. So let's let our listeners hone in on some of the other symbols in the story. So guys, hit us up with some feedback on our social media. So a couple hints that you might want to look for that we noticed. Um, colors, seasons, the months, days of the week. But please tell us anything else you noticed. Amy? Now, they may also want to uh, take a deep dive into the cardinal directions of east and west. You know, when we were sitting in English class right. um, in Austin P, definitely east and west is... What are the names of the characters, uh. the names? What do those names mean? We could go on and on forever, but, you know, that happens in a great short story such as this. It definitely does. So... We really do need to touch on themes, as with any great story. And the themes in this story in their relation to the characters, because they were definitely character-driven, wouldn't you oh, say? Absolutely, absolutely. But this is um, not always true in the case when reading novels, so more so in these short stories. But what I noticed was uh, Miss Russell rather quickly had to develop her characters in order for us to really feel that connection with them. Um, as she has a shorter length or space in a short story to do so. I feel like she kind of tied this in with theme. Definitely. And she really, we felt those characters immediately. Um, I, I'm going to start with Jillian. You okay, go ahead. Jillian? Go ahead. Okay. So there's definitely some strong themes that coincide with her. We've got motherhood, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, love and sacrifice. Oh, yeah. And uh, manipulation. Now, don't forget judgment, too. Ah, judgment. Yes, you're absolutely correct. So she's she was Killian's age when she became a mother, and she was just a child raising a child. She gave him everything of herself. I mean, she even gave the two of them rhyming names. You know, the rhyming names were definitely one of the first things that I noticed when I initially read the story. Uh, didn't she say that if she had a girl, she would have named it Lillian? You betcha. So it definitely kind of gave a Jack and Jill playful cadence to the whole read. Let me go ahead and push this a little further and let you know that I'm feeling a little Humpty Dumpty after all this Prosecco. But, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Let's not fall off the wall. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but, you know, what I noticed was that Jillian really felt like she was being replaced. Right. And not even by a living human. <laughs> But it did make me question how healthy uh, their relationship was as mother and son. You know, as Jillian seemed to hold on to her son too tightly throughout the entire story. Yeah, she, I mean, to me, I just felt like she just wanted to be his friend. I'm a mother of an only child, a boy, and I also had him at a very young age. Uh, you know, the hubs and I got married very young. Um, and as a boy mom... You just can't hold on too tight to these sons, you know, um, which for some of the moms is a tendency. You just have to give them some space in, in order so, you know, they mature correctly into men. Well, I mean, but in Jillian's defense, she's just fulfilling her univers universal duty as a mother to protect him. Yeah, I mean, right. she hourly tries to welcome the bog girl into her home, like, let's get her on my side. But she's silently judging her and her suitability to be with Killian. Yeah, the judging itself uh, is natural, though. I think so. I would agree. But I just, I thought it was an interesting little turn when she just switched back into full on mom mode when the bog girl wakes up and Killian calls right. out for help. You know? 
But the other thing is, um, didn't you feel like Gillian was also a little manipulative? Yeah, I did. Throughout the entire story, Gillian was definitely manipulative. Um, remember the university man when she first told him that uh, she wasn't going to release the bog girl to him? I mean, he wanted to take this bog girl back for scientific study. She told him she was just going to wait until social services could reach her next of kids. That was just so <laughs> that funny. Was absurd. Absurd, but for she sure. used this opportunity. She was very manipulative in this opportunity, but she used it to look like a hero to her son, even if is what Russell writes. It was only for a day and a night. Hey, that's twenty-four hey, hours. You bet, you, right? You bet. But there's also this other instance um, when she taps in on Killian's emotions. Um, so she's waiting, having a little drink mm -hmm. um, for his return gin. after. Gin. Yeah, a little gin. That's right. Not prosecco, but gin. <laughs> gin. After he takes, I couldn't have gin. No. Not right now. He takes the bog girl to the big boy dance. The big boy I love that. That's hilarious. It's awesome. <laughs> but then mom, you know, he comes in and mom manipulates his emotions with stories of his childhood Ugh. and all she did for him as a young single mother trying to make him feel bad about growing up, something right. he has to do. Speaking of growing up, let's look at the themes that kind of correspond with Killian. You know, we've got love loss of innocence, and what we learn in English class, the coming of age. Right. I mean, obviously, love is a big one. I mean, wouldn't I, you agree? I would agree. I would agree. The title itself tells us it's a love story. Um, you know, kind of what spoke to me was when Miss Russell writes that the bog confessed her to Killian. It was love at first sight. And um, Russell describes it as a monstrous, misdirected love. Um, you know, but love truly is intense um, in the beginning. And it's often misdirected. I mean, particularly a first love. I mean, this is this new, so raw emotion. I mean, oh, what a memorable passage. And I feel, you know, we talked about this um, theme of loss of innocence and coming of age. That's also kind of evidenced in Killian's changing feelings about this car. You know, he was saving it for in the beginning of the story. Remember the car? Uh, yeah, he initially wanted that job so he could buy a car to have sex with a girl. <laughs> right. A woman or both. <laughs> you know, here you're starting to win this argument. I mean, maybe, right, maybe he's not gay. But as the story progressive, he just doesn't care about the car anymore. He just doesn't care about acquiring it. No, I mean, he wants to run away with the bog girl and live a simple and easy life, remember? Yeah, no children. No sex. No messy nights vomiting outside bars. No unintended pregnancies. No fights in the street. No betrayals. No surprises. No broken promises. No, no promises. promises. That's right. <laughs> so it also shows when he goes to the school dance and advises his teenage counterparts oh, yes. to wait to have sex until it means something. He is trying to be the voice of reason. He's so grown. But he does. I mean, he comes across grown and he's just echoing what his mother says. I, I think Russell said like a bachelor. He's adopted this bachelor tone. Oh even. yeah, that was good. But his true loss of innocence comes at the end when the bog girl wakes up. He, with his mother's help, decides to take her back home and bury her in the bog. Yep. Finally, I mean, we have to look at the bog girl and her themes of death, the supernatural, and the power of silence. And since we, you know, we did a little of our own exploration of this piece, and we found a lot of people had already discussed death and the supernatural. There are a lot of papers on this. Yeah. A lot. So we're, we're going to limit our focus to the power of silence, but please feel free to tell us your thoughts on these other two themes, or if you found something different. I mean, it goes without saying that the bog girl cannot speak, as she is literally dead. I mean, she's a 2,000-year-old corpse. Well, like Aunt Abby said, um, if you're rounding down, you know, she saw that, that picture of the bog girl in the newspaper. So <laughs> that was kind of funny. <laughs> that was another absurd moment. And um, so when we're talking about the silence, her silence, the bog girl's silence affects each of these characters differently. Jillian is uncomfortable with her silence. The popular girls decide her silence means something terrible has happened to her. They think she's just too traumatized to talk about it. But what about Uncle Sean? You know, he is truly not the least bit undone by her silence. He's not undone by anything. No, okay? he's not. But your thoughts on Killian and the silence? Well, for Killian, initially the bog girl's silence has the power to calm him. 
But uh, when the seasons change, as does life, Killian becomes restless with the Bog Girl's silence. And it raises questions in him about her commitment to their fantasy. Yes, but when the Bog Girl always wakes up and finds her voice, Killian, he can't handle it. Her silence is his fantasy, and he has formed her into what he wants. So now he is forced to take her back to the bog and silence her himself. Oh, which his mother is only too happy to help. That's for sure. But in a sense, he kind of re-kills her. Ooh. Hence his name. I mean, you can't re-kill somebody. I know I'm not an idiot. I know, but... but his name is Killian. That is very fascinating. Mm-hmm. All right. Themes done. Um, in our last few moments, let's briefly touch on language and device. Okay. Um, I think we can look at the way Russell pens her words and how she uses language, device, and structure to really draw the reader in. Well, you know, uh, Wendy, her writing style is so playful and truly somewhat contagious. This story is truly a school teacher's dream piece. Obviously, you're not going to bring up some of the instances that we did in school. You would definitely um, get in trouble for that. But <laughs> Especially when you talk about um, literary devices such as personification, you know, simile, metaphor, hyperbole, and so on, you could definitely teach this in class and just keep it top level. You could. Um, so I think we should share some of the most notable passages of personification, simile, metaphor, and hyperbole by playing a game. Ooh, I love games. So we're going to share our favorites. We'd love to hear yours. All right, Amy, personification, go. Hold on. I got to get my, I got to get my notes. Okay. Personification. Okay. I'm going to do this one. Here was a secret flagging him down. The bog confessor. Your turn. Go. Oh, um, let's see. Oh, her bright red hair racing the tail of the noose down her spine. Good one. All right. Simile, go. Oh. I gotta go with this one. Uncle Sean was as blandly ugly as a toenail. You agree? Good yeah, one. I knew you were gonna use that. <laughs> okay, so well, you know, I got a little banter on this one. So you know he was full of nasty toe jam. Oh, I can so smell it. Do you like your mama jokes? Oh dear. I'm gonna tell you an Uncle Sean joke. Uncle Sean is so lazy. Why? He ate the sticker on the apple. <laughs> he did. <laughs> Disgusting. <laughs> Here's my simile. Killian and the bog girl stood under a palm tree that looked like an enormous toilet brush. I'm sort of envisioning um, the bog girl's hair. It looks like a toilet brush. <laughs> well, I mean, cut the girl some slack. She hasn't been to a salon in over a thousand years. Oh, funny. You know, we need to give her Maha's number. Ah, oh, we should give her Maha's number. Give me a metaphor. Okay. Killian was holding the reins of her life. Now, remember, when he was holding the bog girl's hair and the noose in the beginning, do you remember yeah. that? Let's move on to hyperbole and wrap this bad boy up. Okay. I know we've talked about this, but it's one of the best in the story. Dinner was meatloaf with onions, and for Sean... A thousand, a thousand beers. beers. All right, come on, Amy. Let's do a couple oxymorons. Okay. My favorite was Virgin Mother. Oh, yeah. We can't forget. And Diet Candy, candy Bars. bars. <laughs> so true, Wendy. Cheers. Okay. So, in regards to structure, Ms. Russell really stretches this short story into somewhat of a novella. Or a novelette, depending on what resource you look to for word count. It did last a little bit longer than a short story. Yes, it did, because a close reading will render you about an hour, 45 minutes to an hour. An hour for me. Yeah. And I really, you know, it's not typically my thing, but I really did enjoy listening to the author read the story on the NewYorker.com website as well. You know, she did have a real playful tone in her voice. Um She's definitely an author that I'm going to revisit uh, for future pieces of prose. I would love to have her book. Without a doubt. So, I mean, that's it. I mean, this short story was a great piece to inaugurate our virtual book club. Oh, yeah. We hope all of you listeners will join us again. In future episodes, we will address our inbox. We call our email our sparkling wine box. 
We would love for you to provide feedback or post questions we can answer in subsequent episodes. Because we are English teachers, we love a good play on words. Sparkles are positives. And wines are things we can do better. In our next episode, we will discuss two short stories, Speech Sounds by Octavia E. Butler and Pandemic by Jesse F. Bone. Both of these shorts are available for free online as print or audio. So just search the Google webs and then be sure to join us next time. Thank you again for joining us for this episode of Prosecco and Prose. Please subscribe to our podcast wherever you download all your favorite podcasts. We would love to hear your reviews or special requests on future pieces of prose. We want to hear your voice as this is your book club. You can also send your questions and comments to prosecco.prose at gmail.com. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter at pnprose. And on Instagram at Prosecco and Prose. Find and friend us on Facebook. Just plug in Prosecco space, capital N space, prose. I'm Amy. And I'm Wendy. Signing off as our bottle of bubbly is now empty. See you for our next episode. And in the meantime, pop a cork and read. Thank you.